Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. And I had a really interesting conversation with Darren Nix, the group manager at Indeed Assessments. And Darren is running a remote first team that operates like a startup inside Indeed. And you know Indeed, it's a huge company, lots of resources, solving big problems, lots of big data. And Darren's team is hiring. Take a listen. Darren, tell me about the big picture problem you're solving at Indeed Assessments. What our team does is we build tools so job seekers can show off their knowledge, skills, and abilities when they're trying to get a job way better than a resume can. And that lets employers find uh, great hires a lot quicker too and makes the process better for everybody. So you're running a remote first team, looking to hire pretty aggressively. Java engineers, front end to React engineers, Ruby on Rails engineers, UX designers, business intelligence, and you operate Indeed assessments like a startup that lives inside Indeed. Tell me more. Because we're basically a startup within Indeed, we get to hire folks all around the country, even if they're not in Austin or San Francisco or Seattle. And that means we can hire really great engineers who want to be able to work from their home city, work on really big problems, but solve those problems in a startup-y way. You know, we host our code on GitHub, or Rails and Redis, use Postgres and React, and we're push on green. So we deploy six times a day. So I've seen charts that say like, hey, we deployed 13 times this week. And I'm like, haha, we deployed like 78 times because we like to go fast. And so what we're doing here at Indeed is finding ways to be able to continue to be startup B, but solve really big problems and help hundreds of millions of people get jobs. So if helping out your fellow engineers get jobs, Job sounds like an exciting problem and you like working on startup tools at a really big scale, send us a note, reach out. I actually interview every single person who comes to join our team. So I'll be meeting with you and I look forward to hearing from you. So if you're looking to join a remote first team working on really big problems that will literally impact hundreds of millions of people, head to indeed.job slash changelog to learn more and take that first step. Hello and welcome to another episode of JS Party. I'm Tim Smith, senior producer at Changelog. The JS Party crew is still on a well-deserved break, but that doesn't mean we leave you with nothing to listen to. Come on now. JS Party panelist and Changelog correspondent, K-Ball, was in Carlsbad, California for JS Conf US and sat down to chat with Chad Haitala about compilers for the front end, Ember, WebAssembly, and the future of performance optimization for the web. Enjoy. Hey everybody, K-Ball here reporting live from JSConf US. I'm here with Chad Hytala, engineer from LinkedIn and member of the Ember core team. Chad, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Life is good. Thanks for taking the time today. Yeah, no problem. So you're speaking at this conference. Can you tell us a little bit about the talk that you're doing? Yeah, so I'm talking a little bit about uh, compilers in the front end uh, JavaScript space. And we've used compilers for quite a long period of time, even though a lot of people don't think of like things like minifiers as being compilers. And we've used compilers to kind of achieve different performance benefits and everything like that inside the browser. But um, today, when we think about compilers, it's more like things like Babel and transpiling languages and everything like that, and not necessarily uh, getting performance gains out of the usage of compilers. And so I've done a decent amount of work over the past couple of years on compilers that are specifically um, designed for performance-related re reasons and not necessarily like transpiling languages and stuff, stuff like that. There's some interesting possibilities there. So you know, everything from kind of what Webpack is trying to do with tree shaking and mm -hmm. things like that, yeah. but Ember's really pushing the boundaries there and yeah. having a, a VM that is perhaps not running just pure JavaScript. Can you talk a little bit more details on what you're doing there? Right, so we've gone through a couple, or actually I think three iterations of the rendering engine inside of Ember. Um, and all of them are, they start off as like a string-based concatenation solution that I think a lot of people did uh, uh, or like maybe 2011, that's basically what everybody did. And then we moved to more of a DOM-based um, 
like solution. So we would take templates, compile them into a JavaScript program that constructed DOM. And this is kind of what like um, everybody's doing today. Effectively, you have some like DSL or DSL-like thing. It gets compiled to JavaScript, and you run it in the browser. Um, and so the Glimmer VM is different in this regard. Um, it actually, what we actually end up doing is taking your templates and compiling them to binary data. And what this binary data is just an encoding of all of the instructions to recreate that template at runtime. Um, and we do so by putting that, that you know, custom bytecode inside of a virtual machine. The virtual machine interprets it and constructs your UI. So it's a pretty different approach um, when compared to other things, I think, in this space right now. Seems like you could get a lot of space saving in terms of bytes over right. the wire doing that. Do you have any numbers on what kinds of uh you know, difference that makes when you're compiling um, few so cave templates? So you can compi like compact uh, like numbers pretty uh, efficiently. Um, so let me think if I have any uh, hard numbers off the top of my head. So um, in the project that we worked on uh, at LinkedIn, where we actually sh shipped this thing into production, um, the LinkedIn feed is rather complicated. It has many different like feed types, which have you know different things that a user can interact with. And so for this one page, uh, all of the templates in the entire application end up being only uh, 14 kilobytes when you ship it over, over the wire. So it compresses rather small. Um, in comparison to things like JavaScript, where you don't have as much repetition, so algorithms like Bratly or Gzip just don't see enough things inside the compression window um, to actually um, reduce the actual size of the file. Yeah, that's that's interesting because yeah, a lot of folks, you know, text and templates traditionally compressed reasonably well, but yeah. now in advanced JavaScript, you're compiling those templates to be JavaScript functions, which no longer compress yeah. well, and then shipping those over the wire. Right. Right. Huh. That's kind of neat. So what kind of runtime performance do you see when you're having to reconstruct these things from binary? So the big, I think, issue with what we've done in the web development community is that we've pushed more and more emphasis on like JavaScript. You used to start with like HTML and CSS, and then you just layered a little bit of JavaScript to get some interactivity on it. And now we like really start with like JavaScript first, and then we add CSS to it, but like the CSS may even be in JavaScript land. So HTML is basically nowhere to be seen for a lot of people. Um, and there is an inherent cost of having everything in JavaScript, and that is it's a textual-based language that at runtime, it needs to be turned into code that a computer actually can run. So it has to go through a parsing step. It has to go through a compilation step. Um, and so because of that, the startup time of these applications can be rather large, especially if you're uh, on like a constrained device, a low-end device, um, or even like the network aspect of it. If you're shipping, if you have put all your concerns inside of JavaScript, your JavaScript bundles are going to be rather large um, right out of the gate. Um, so those are like the two areas that we're um, kind of concerned about with like the Glimmer VM is like more or less like JavaScript startup time. And so by compiling templates to binary, uh, you actually bypass the parse and compile step because the browser just sees the binary data as raw memory and it just passes it directly to native library. So for the templates inside your application, uh, they ended up being anywhere from like 25 to 40% of a typical Ember application. So that's a rather large chunk of the of, of a project. And so if we can bypass parse and compile or not compile those things to, to JavaScript, but instead of a format that doesn't have these inherent uh, not performance issues, but they're just the, the the truth of the world. If you're compiling in JavaScript, it has to go through a parse and compile. Then if we're not doing that, then we can speed up the startup time of these applications. And a lot of times, like even the transmission of the templates and everything like that over the wire. This is something that I think we're seeing a lot more interest in now that yeah. WebAssembly is right. a thing. Right. But y'all have been doing it since before WebAssembly was supported, right? It's its own. Yeah, so this is an, our, our own bytecode format. And we really think about 
WebAssembly being very closely aligned um, with this world. It, it's kind of a similar philosophy that we're providing more or less a bytecode set for constructing DOM on the main thread. WebAssembly currently doesn't have uh, all of the web IDL stuff in it, so you to actually call into JavaScript from WebAssembly, you have to effectively give it like a context object that WebAssembly side knows to call into to like talk to DOM APIs. So we've actually done some work in this area to kind of like pair these two worlds together. So we have a version of the Glimmer VM with a custom byte with our custom bytecode, but in the the core virtual machine is dealing with a lot of like kind of low level operations. It has like a stack implementation, it has pointers, it has registers. And so those are things that like writing things in like systems language is, is like really good at uh, dealing with those types of problems. So we ported those things to Rust and then compiled those to WebAssembly. So you have this uh, virtual machine that is uh, more or less like using bytecode formats for a lot of different things inside of the application. And I, get, I think one of the nice things about this is when you're when you have a domain specific language like a templating layer, you actually can control the output of what you are, you because you're owning the entire compiler stack, you basically rule the world. You're not actually beholden to JavaScript semantics or anything like that. And so this is, I think, a pretty interesting space. It's moving frameworks closer to being more like compilers um, than like these runtime libraries and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a trend that I think we're seeing more and more in the JavaScript yeah. world. Uh, Babel enables a lot mm -hmm. of that, and you've seen you know React takes advantage of that with JSX being yep. essentially it's a compilation step, it's yep. a DSL. Now they're compiling to JavaScript rather than to a bytecode, but yeah. it's the same idea of we have these domains that are constrained and well known. Yep. What can we do to mm -hmm. do a better job? than just a general purpose language on that. Right, and I think uh, other frameworks that are in the space that are doing like really interesting thing is like uh, all of Rich Harris's work around like Svelte um, of having um, basically compiling directly into a very small set of JavaScript that you would otherwise write for your templating languages. And he really kind of fundamentally believes that this is where uh, things are headed as well, is like I have a framework, I'm writing uh, this thing, all the code for the quote unquote framework is just the code that I write and there's a compilation step to take care of that. Um, Facebook is doing a lot of interesting things around uh, prepack, which is an optimizing compiler uh, for JavaScript. Uh, is very like a very challenging problem to solve due to like the dynamic nature of JavaScript, but they're also really in, uh, doing a lot of work in compilers as well. That's interesting. So where do you see the field going? I think it's kind of hard to say, but I think there is um, a lot of things pointing uh, towards having more low-level implementations of things like things like WebAssembly, I think, are a good example of that. The Glimmer VM stuff is a good example of that. Um, uh, I believe that uh, Chris Baxter and Malta from the AMP team are going to be talking about some low-level uh, things that are also kind of in like the same realm of like the, what the Glimmer VM is trying to do and everything like that. So it's coming up with, I think, these different or more efficient uh, formats or more efficient compilation targets for building stuff for the web. And I think this is, uh, a lot of this is coming from the fact that um, the markets that we're trying, like a lot of people are trying to be successful in are uh, constrained devices in terms of like, if you're in emerging markets, you really have to think about the power of those devices in those markets and you can't just be dumping large, huge piles of JavaScript on to your users, but at the same time, you want these applications to be very interactive. You don't want to necessarily um, remove functionality, but uh, you need to, the reality of these worlds is that the, the network is not very good and the devices aren't that great. And I think this is even true in, inside of like the United States. Um, we do a lot of develop, like a lot of, 
engineers do a lot of development on like their MacBook Pro or their iPhone X, and not everybody has those devices. I think anywhere where your users typically are going to be is anywhere from like these top end devices to like the top portion of like these low end devices, and we don't do enough like testing uh, up and down the spectrum. Yeah, there's all sorts of elements of performance that you never hit if you're just doing it on your top end mm -hmm. devices. Uh, network performance gets talked about a lot, but even just CPU performance right. on these yep. devices, like parsing and booting up all that JavaScript chews up a ton of CPU. Yeah. Yeah. And even on, I, I mean, I have a iPhone 7, yep. right? And it, it slows down on some of yeah. these sites. And yeah. it's like crawling along much less if you get network problems yep. and things like yep. that. So yeah, there's, there's truth to that. Um, so compilers let you get a lot of that out of the tooling. So you don't have yeah. to be an expert on everything about optimizing for mobile, et cetera. The compiler right. can do a lot for you. Right. I think this was, um, so there was a, a great blog article by some of the folks at Mozilla um, earlier this year where they talked about um, their work that they've done on source maps. And so there's a source map library that most people use that is uh, the encoder and decoder and writer for source maps. And it was written in JavaScript. And what they did was that they moved parts of that into WebAssembly. And the reason why they did that was they felt that they could get more predictable performance out of it. Um, and then what ended up happening in the story is like uh, one of the engineers that used to work on V8, the old, uh, or the, or not V8, uh, he used to work on Turbofan, which is uh, was a, the actual JIT compiler inside of V8, says, oh, you don't actually need WebAssembly, you just need to like hand tune, optimize all this JavaScript, and you can get like a lot of performance out of it, and maybe some corrections algorithms. But I think that, that tells you something about the underlying platform. Not everybody is uh, a JavaScript engine, engine engineer, and they can't tell you all the hot path. You, you can't ask like a, you know, a person that's building like a lot of products and everything like that, and they have different concerns, like, please tell me all the hot paths inside of V8 so I can get the most performance out of this thing. It's like, it's not very scalable in my opinion. And so I think what we have to be choosing and thinking about or even building are tools that, um, give the largest group of people um, the most predictable performance out of the box. Um, I think that's the types of tools that we should be really thinking about building. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Rollbar. How important is it for you to catch errors before your users do? What if you could resolve those errors in minutes and then deploy with confidence? That's exactly what Rollbar enables for software teams. One of the most frustrating things we all deal with is errors. Most teams either A, rely on their users to report errors, or B, use log files and lists of errors to debug problems. That's such a waste of time. Instantly know what's broken and why with Rollbar. Reduce time wasted debugging and automatically capture errors alongside rich diagnostic data to help you defeat impactful errors. You can integrate Rollbar into your existing workflow. It integrates with your source code repository and deployment system to give you deep insights into exactly what changes caused each error. Give Rollbar a try today at no cost to you. No credit card is required. Our listeners get access to the Bootstrap plan with 100,000 events for free for 90 days. To get started, head to rollbar.com slash changelog. That's really interesting. When you talk about that, it made me think about, you know, traditional compilers, yeah. you're compiling for multiple different targets yeah. and oftentimes optimizing down to the level of cache hierarchy and mm -hmm. things like that. Do you see a direction going in that way for the web, for either JavaScript or WebAssembly, where they're literally shipping either different binaries or binaries that are adaptive and run slightly different ways to tune themselves to the engine performances? So the nice thing about WebAssembly is that it is effectively a short, pa uh, like it's a short, uh, a known shortcut into uh, highly optimized code in basically all of the, the browsers, like, um, the way that the underlying browser is going to work, it, like typically with JavaScript, it goes through a couple different tiers of a compiler, and it starts off as 
code that can like start up quick, but it's not as fast, then it goes over to an optimizing compiler and generates optimized code. Uh, but due to the dynamic nature of the browser, like that optimized code can get thrown out because it may see like different arguments or different types of arguments and therefore has to start all over again. Well, with things like WebAssembly, you start at highly optimized code because um, you're, you're writing in a static language that guarantees you type information that these, I'm always gonna get like an int in this position and it's not gonna be like an int and then all of a sudden become like a string or something like that. So the code that's generated at runtime for the WebAssembly stuff is already highly optimized. So I don't know if there's going to be necessarily compiling like different types of like WebAssembly to target like hot paths in certain browser. I, I think they've done an actually very good job at specifying uh, the compile targets and everything like that for these things. So I don't really see something like that. Yeah, I read a fascinating post not that long ago talking about how even just shifting the order of keys in an object yep. could cause your browser to throw out its compiled version right, of the JavaScript right. and things like that. Like this stuff is, is temperamental. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another related question, so another area where we have a, a big gap because mm -hmm. folks feel like they need to become experts to be able to do it is dealing with accessibility yep. and making web applications mm -hmm. accessible across a wide range of devices is something that it's one of those things where everybody kind of knows they should do it and almost nobody actually does do right. it. And in a recent Part, JS Party episode, we were talking about how one of the, the changes that needs to happen there is improving the tooling to right. make it much more accessible to people so you don't have to be an accessibility expert to write yep. accessible applications. Right. Is that something that compilers can help out with as well? Um, maybe. I think that some of the challenges that we have inside of Ember, um, and basically any JavaScript application has this if you're using a router, is um, making sure that when you do a page transition, that you set focus on to the actual page that transition. Otherwise, it's basically dead, dead silence. Um, and so you potentially could do uh, some like detection, almost like linting to make sure that maybe you do, you know, focus on this thing when it becomes like active or whatever like that. Um, but I think this is more, a little bit more of a, a runtime um, concern rather than uh, a compiler, but I think that compilers like linting, if you need to call certain APIs, need to be there. I think um, Ryan Florence has like uh, the reach router for React, which is really trying to bake accessibility in by default um, and handling a lot of these, specifically with routing cases uh, and announcing to to the user that like a page transition and like highlighting the, like the you know h1 element of a page whenever you do the transition so I think it's a, a bit more uh, runtime specific but I think you can use compilers to make sure that like certain things in your application are like following best practices or something to that effect but um, I'm I'm a huge um, proponent of having Thing, having uh, solutions do the right thing out of the box, yeah, uh, making it very hard for you to do the bad thing. Um, and so I think like this is just a, another area of opportunity within the uh, JavaScript ecosystem to solve some of these problems uh, more fundamentally. Yeah, uh, Rust is kind of an interesting example of a place where a compiler it tends to be very strict mm -hmm. and they've put a ton of energy into making their error messages very right. explicit. Yep. Of, this is what went wrong, and this is how you might fix it, and doing a very good job of yep. trying to figure that. When you talk about you know, domain-specific languages and templates, yep. that's one area where there's a lot of accessibility stuff mm -hmm. that people might not be thinking about. Yep. And you could potentially statically analyze that yeah. and throw those types of errors where you say, hey, you know what? You're putting an input here, but you are not marking it up properly. Right. Um, yeah. So. We actually have stuff like this in, in the Ember ecosystem. We have add-ons. There's like a Ember AY11 uh, ESLint rules or whatever because we can statically analyze the templates and uh, they're not as dynamic as, as like something like JavaScript. So we can look at it and see like, oh, you're missing like labels for things, so on and so forth, um, or like making sure that you're using ARIA rules correctly. Um, those are, I think. Uh, like I said, those are the ways that we kind of are attacking like that problem. Are there any other domain specific languages that you're seeing in the JavaScript ecosystem that aren't yet 
taking advantage of some sort of compilation step that yeah, probably so could? I think there's like huge um, opportunities for both Vue and Angular to do a fundamentally what we're doing. I think in 2016, uh, the Angular team came out with uh, a blog article that was called like, why we use like templates or something to the fact, and we are like philosophically aligned on why we choose to use templating languages over um, just using JavaScript. And it has a lot to do with being able to swap out these implementations without breaking our end user's code. Um, I think there is huge power uh, in that, and in like large organizations like LinkedIn, uh, we have like a hundred applications. And if we want to have people take advantage of like these new primitives that exist in the browser immediately, we just swap out that underlying implementation and uh, developers don't actually have to change any code. Yeah, and Ember in particular, I think of all the frameworks, Vue might be close there, but they've done a tremendous job at making upgrades easy yeah. and keep, I mean, the Vue one to two switchover was hard, but since then they've been really good about mm -hmm. being consistent. Um, that's something that perhaps Angular has not been as good on. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that, that is an interesting highlight. What about outside of the web world? Do you see anything there where? Mm, no, I mean, I'm primar primarily looking at web-related stuff. I think Rust, um, not anything to do with like domain-specific languages, but like I think Rust is very interesting. I think WebAssembly uh, is being, it, it has a very weird name. It's like a portable uh, compilation target that can run pretty much anywhere that JavaScript can run, which is very interesting because JavaScript is used in all different places that you would not expect it to be used. Like this is like all the IoT stuff. It's like in refrigerators, it's in car dashboards. I think it's like used in like nuclear, uh, like silos for different things. Oh, uh, JavaScript's like, being used, in, uh, now you're scaring <laughs> like, me. Yeah. At least um, TypeScript, I hope. <laughs> yeah, so all those places where you're using JavaScript, you could probably write something like C, C++, and maybe get some performance benefit out of it because you're compiling to a target that is running in the same place that JavaScript is. So I think uh, the future is, is for WebAssembly may not actually even be completely for the web. It's like basically where any anywhere where JavaScript can run, uh, I think uh, WebAssembly is going to be able to run, which kind of puts into question like why uh, you're distroing like all these like C libraries and everything like that. Um, so I, th I think it's kind of uh, it, we'll see what happens, but I think it's kind of interesting that we have we now actually have a, a, for a binary format that can run in the same places that JavaScript run. Yeah, I had a conversation with Jay Phelps about yeah. WebAssembly yeah. at some point, and he's like, "All right, so we call it WebAssembly." But really, imagine if you'd created the JVM, except instead of it being one company that could be bought out by Oracle, you yeah. had it you know, co-designed by all the big web companies, yeah. and it was in the open so that you know, it was not able to be obtained by a bad actor and then yeah. all sorts of stuff. Uh, like This could be the new virtual machine target that everybody right. yep. pushes for, yep. which is phenomenal. Yeah, and it's pretty interesting that like, like uh, Java tried to, uh, I mean, Java is extremely successful. We use it a lot at, at LinkedIn, but it, it had different ambitions at one point for like being for the web and everything like that. And JavaScript was this toy language. And uh, we'll see how, uh, History treats uh, that that situation. I don't. Yeah, I, don't know. I mean, the so long as we keep WebAssembly out of Oracle's hands, I think we'll be <laughs> yeah. better off yeah. um, in a lot of ways. I mean, the Java ecosystem is still very powerful, and there's yep. a lot of interesting yep. innovation going on there. But yeah, it's nice to have an alternative that yeah. is more open. Yep. Uh, cool. So I want to poke more on Ember if you've got time. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, Ember has. I've never used Ember in a production project. Okay. Um, I've done some playing around with it, uh, uh -huh. largely because I've had friends who are big advocates. Mm -hmm. And every and well, the other thing is like Yehuda Katz is like one of my tech idols. Where oh, okay. I, everything yeah. he touches, I'm like, oh, that, <laughs> that's brilliant. But uh, it's always sort of been the like chug along, like never taken off. Do you mm -hmm. have a set feeling as to to why? Why is it that we talk about React Angular mm -hmm. view and mm -hmm. Ember's doing this wicked cool stuff with a binary engine and doing all these things? But it's, it's not taken off. So I think Ember has always kind of been like this 
framework that has kind of always been there. You kind of talk about it, and it, it's lasted, I think, several different like JavaScript half-lives at this point. So it came out right around the same time that Backbone came out. No one really talks about Backbone any, anymore. Right. Um, then like we made some, it also lived through the period of like Angular 1. Not too many people are using Angular 1 anymore. Surprising number I've seen, actually. <laughs> well, there's, there's still a lot of people using. Yeah, there's a lot of people using it, but it isn't like the thing that everybody is talking about. Right, yeah, it's not uh, the hot thing it, anymore It's not at the all. hot thing. Like I, I agree with the people that are probably still using Angular 1. They have a business and it is built on Angular 1. That business is making money. You cannot just abandon it. Um, and now we're kind of like in this, re we went through like the React thing. Uh, we're st still there, still working on the framework. Uh, now it's kind of like the whole ridiculous thing with like the GitHub stars with Vue and React. So like maybe Vue becomes like the thing that is talked about all the time and React is kind of. Most popular <laughs> blog post I ever wrote was basically saying like, look y'all, GitHub stars are not everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Basically I just looked at what are some other ways we could measure right. this? Yeah. Hey, we could look at NPM downloads. That might give us an alternative measure. Yeah. And like, pretty much every other measure besides GitHub stars, React is still like yeah. worlds ahead right. of everything. Right. And I say that as somebody who loves Vue. Like, it's a, it's a beautiful <laughs> framework. But so all of this is going on, um, and I think people tend to like they're attracted to the new the new hotness, and you're always chasing the hype train. Um, I think Ember has always been targeting a, a different set of people, which is um, I want something that I know that I can build my business on top of and that it has long-term stability guarantees. Um, and I'm okay with, for some period of time, not having necessarily the most uh, new thing on the block, but I, I'm confident that the framework will take those good ideas and roll it back into the framework. Right, and so that's basically what we've we what we've done over the course of Ember's history is stay the chorus, keep everything as stable as possible. Um, when we do a major version bump, I think this is a good example of this. It isn't recreate the world. All we do in a major there are no new features ever in a major release. We just remove all the features that we deprecated in the previous major version. And so, um, as we're Going through the through this process, we've learned a lot of things along the way. So one example is of that is I think the thing that React is most uh, widely known for is the whole like set state model, like set state re-render the world. Yep. And so while we we've, we've had templates um, ever since the beginning of Ember, we were able to recreate those semantics inside of Ember. So we have. Um, Older versions of Ember have this dot set. Newer versions don't have these uh, accessor type of APIs. Um, but in the same same thing is that when you call this dot set, you reset the world. We re-render the entire application. Um, and so we've been able to like take things from different communities and kind of like um, figure out how they map into the the Ember world. Um, I and maybe maybe the tide is turned turning a little bit on this because I think we are starting to see things that are um, what what are called as like no configuration uh, type of solutions. It's just convention over configuration. It just has a different name. So right. things like Prettier are now becoming uh, very, very popular. And it's because people don't have to think a lot of, about these decisions. Uh, Ember comes with you like the same type of philosophy that these decisions that you're making with your team don't really, like, things like, okay, well, how should we lay out the project? The file system case uh, problem is always, like, uh, a thing that people argue about. Like, how do I lay out a project? Well, it, it matters, but it doesn't matter, like, to the extent that it's going to harm your business if you do not get the file system correct on your, on your application. And so what we try to do is try to make some of those decisions for you uh, up front um, and just say, this is how, like, an Ember application is set up. And you don't have to think about it, and all you have to do is really think about the features that you want to build uh, on top of like the framework. Um, so, I, I think we are. I feel good about the the future of Ember just because of like how things are trending. Uh, it was a little bit weird 
when we were like the only people that had a Ember seal or like a CLI tool. Now everybody has a CLI tool that is trying to set up the project in uh, some sane way so that you don't have to sit there and make all these decisions. So I think. Yeah, didn't the first version of the Angular CLI ship with comments that were still Ember CLI because yeah, they had they patched it. standard uh, standard out or something like that to rewrite all all locations of like Ember into Angular, but like th words like remember were getting remapped into like saying like <laughs> had Angular Re somewhere. Angular. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. hilarious. Um, but yeah, um, I th I think. The, I think the tide is changing a, a little bit in, in terms of the, the front end ecosystem. This episode of JS Party is brought to you by NativeScript. NativeScript is an open source framework for building truly native mobile apps for iOS and Android using JavaScript and TypeScript with frameworks like Angular and Vue. And in this segment, I'm talking with TJ Van Toll from the NativeScript team about why people should care about NativeScript. Thanks, Adam. So I'll give you three quick reasons. First, NativeScript is just a great way to get into iOS and Android development if you're coming from a JavaScript background. You get to use a lot of the tech you might already know when you're building NativeScript apps. So you use using things like CSS, NPM, Webpack, and of course, JavaScript. Second, with NativeScript, we let you build performant apps. With NativeScript, we're rendering your apps using native user interface components, so we don't use web views in any way. So your apps are really snappy, and they feel great when your users use them. And finally, in NativeScript, we support both Angular and Vue.js. So if you're already using those frameworks on the web, I think you'll find it's just a lot of fun to use a framework you already know and to create native iOS and Android apps using that same tech stack. All right. If you want to learn more about NativeScript and you like what TJ had to say about NativeScript and what it has to offer you when building mobile apps for iOS and Android, head to nativescript.org slash jsparty. Once again, nativescript.org slash jsparty. One of the beautiful things in the last few years is that we've seen so much cross-pollination yeah. and we've seen you know, folks will experiment with something and if it works well, it gets adopted yeah. across the board. And yeah. we saw that you know, with virtual DOM, we see that with the set state model, um, seen that you know, component-based architectures, yeah. all these things are kind of propagating out and it's making the web better. Yeah. Um, I think another one that Ember was early on was the server-side rendering, Ember Fastboot, and yep. things around those things. Yep. Um, so are you seeing, uh, I know it's always been, it's never been the hot yeah. thing, but it's also never really fallen off. Ember's right. just been kind of slow and steady the yep. whole whole way along. You said you see the tide turning. Are you seeing more and more people getting involved? Or? Yeah, I think uh, there is definitely, the community I think is more active than I think it's ever been. And I think that's because in Ember 2.0, what a lot of the work we did was a lot of like foundational things, like working on like the Glimmer VM, and we weren't necessarily um, we did, we were pretty bad about doing like external communication of like what are we working on, like why aren't we shipping more like user facing um, APIs, and so. Um, we do things like, uh, the one nice thing that we did this year was we do like uh, an RFC and it's like a, or a call for proposals, but it is specifically for people in the community that tell us what you think we should be working on. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like inverting the model um, and asking what are the actual pain points of the community and then we take that feedback, feedback and we're rolling that into like our roadmap. And one of those things was like, you guys need to talk more about like the things that you're doing because you guys are doing awesome, awesome things, but not a lot of people know about them. Uh, in the community, you can get confused if like you don't hear anything from like the core team. Um, so 2.0 was getting a lot of this foundational things, foundational things in place, and then 3.0 has been like, okay, we have this really good foundation. Now let's start exposing all of like these uh, this functionality that like this. Glimmer VM can do. So this is like things like landing, server-side rendering with rehydration. We have a plan to do uh, like incremental style rendering, kind of how the React suspense stuff works. Uh, different uh, kind of user-facing APIs. And so there's just more and more, we, we use an RFC process, so there's more and more RFCs and we have a lot more community engagement in these things. And I think a lot of people are excited about what they're seeing. 
Yeah, the, the RFC process is actually another place where I feel like Ember was a bit of a trailblazer. Like yeah. doing that all in the open and, and having tremendous amounts of discussion going yep. on there. I was at ViewConf this year. Yep. And one of the big items they were talking about is we're going to open our process. We're going to do basically what Ember's been doing yeah. and try to you know implement um, the RFCs. They're talking about release channels, all of these things. So it's not just uh, technical components where yep. we were seeing great cross-pollination, but a lot of the kind of like procedural procedural and yep. management things, we as an industry are getting better yeah, at for sure. managing change, at managing open source projects, at managing communication yep. and things like yep. that. Um, I'd be interested in exploring a slightly different channel mm -hmm. on this, which is you've been involved with Ember for a while now, is that? Uh, about 2014, so about four years now, yeah. Yeah, and was that all through LinkedIn? Uh, I did a little bit of like, so at, at the startup that I worked at before I went to LinkedIn, I had to build the, like an analytics dashboard and Ember had just came out. I thought it was like pretty cool. Um, uh, at the time, the documentation was not that great, and I reached out to Trek, who was one of the original core team members, and I was just trying to like figure out how this thing worked. And I'm like, yeah, it seems like kind of cool, but I have like a team of like four other people, and I can't like sit here and write documentation for like this framework right now. So we went and built like an Angular one application, but I always kind of like kept an eye on like the Ember ecosystem. Yeah, so it's been about when I went to LinkedIn. We were building a lot of backbone applications and we were dealing with a lot of like the fundamental things about building a uh, client side application. So this is, I don't know if, how many people remember, but like backbone views, if you had nested views inside of them, you had to make sure that you properly nuke the child views before you tore down the parent. Otherwise you have like these zombie views sitting around that are getting all the user events and all that stuff. So I'm like, we're spending way too much time like thinking about like these fundamental things that I think other frameworks are like Angular had already, I think solved this problem. Like we just need something that is solving some, some of these like core things about right. building these types right. of applications. So that's kind of how I got started with, uh, with Ember stuff is. Yeah, you know, so one of the things I, I've noticed is LinkedIn is a big sponsor of Ember in a lot yep. of ways, or at, at least has a lot of employees mm -hmm. who are involved with Ember and on the core team and things yep. like that. Can you talk a little bit about LinkedIn's approach to open source mm -hmm. and, and how you do that? And I know LinkedIn is now part of Microsoft, so there yeah. may be some changes that have happened there, but. Yeah, so I don't think much has changed since, I mean, I've been at LinkedIn now for, what, almost five and a half years. Um, and the Microsoft acquisition didn't really change the culture at all. I mean, I guess my paycheck technically comes from Microsoft now, but like that's really, really about it. Um, so the way that I think LinkedIn approaches um, open source, or the at least the way that um, our team works and how we've uh, like acquired people uh, from like the Ember core team um, and had them come work for us has been um, we use Ember like as if it was used at like any other company. That being said, we also want to be able to push on the framework and get a lot of features that may make like, um, so like the project that I'm working on right now is re revamping how we do um, like performance tracking inside of these applications. And there's some nicer APIs that we could have to more accurately measure some things. And so by having people from the core team, it's uh, you see a lot of different use cases, um, especially with these really large applications. And so what we're kind of responsible for is kind of like facilitating our, or fil facilitating the, the design, um, getting consensus among amongst other people that are not at LinkedIn, like this is a, like explaining the problem space, you know, maybe doing a couple iterations on the design, putting the RFC up, getting community buy-in and doing the implementation. So it's it allows us to see uh, very different problems. And then we're also, it's great for, I think, LinkedIn because we can, um, they can dedicate us to like, hey, we actually really, really need this thing. So can you please just work on this open source thing for us so that we can achieve our, our goals. Um, we also do like different, uh, we, when we open source like projects internally, we have like processes for that. So uh, Chris Epstein from, uh, who works at LinkedIn as well, is like, uh, 
worked on has worked on SaaS in the past and uh, things like Compass. Um, recently uh, released uh, CSS Blocks, which is like a new CSS uh, framework. And so we also do those types of things as well, where internally, like all last year, Chris was working on this thing, and then we released it to, to the public, I think under like Apache license or something like that. So um, that's kind of like how we, I guess, do open source there. We, we're active members of the community. We, we don't really see ourselves like taking over it or whatever. We go through like the same process that anybody at any company would go through. Yeah, I really appreciate that over, you know, there, there are some companies that do a lot of open source, but it's all their open source. Yeah. And they're <laughs> going to drive the decision making yeah. through their channels. and. I mean, I've been involved in one of those projects, and yep. those are better than closed source projects. Yeah. But it is uh, certainly sometimes feels like they're railroading right. some of the rest of the the community out there. Yep. So I'm curious when when there's a project that is started inside of LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So CSS Blocks is a good yep. example, uh, which is fascinating take on it's sort of. CSS and JS, but not really. Yeah, you know, it's, we did a lot of work in compilers last year. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, it's, yeah. it's really cool. I, I actually like looked at that and I was like, because I, I have been skeptical of a lot of CSS and JS mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I looked at that and I was like, all right, I'll take that. That looks fine. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. They, where you're you're utilizing the strengths of both, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, whereas I feel like not all, but most CSS and JS are like, I don't get CSS quite right. Like yeah. JS all the things. Yeah. And yeah. you know, as much as I love JavaScript, it's not the best language for everything. Yeah. Um, CSS Blocks does a beautiful job of using the strengths of both yeah. CSS yeah. and JavaScript. I think that was like, uh, I, the thing that I really liked about the approach is that it's using all, basically all of the CSS language and parts of the actual specification to layer on these semantics on top of like JSX uh, um, files or even in like Ember templates and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so coming back to my, my question on that, do those end up, like when there's a project that starts inside of LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Do does that end up getting treated in that sort of corporate-driven open source manner, or do you all try to push out to community governance? So uh, I don't know what the official uh, like policy is on this stuff, but I can tell you that we have a couple uh, big projects here that that come to mind. So uh, LinkedIn is kind of famously known for like developing Kafka. Um, Kafka is now I think like under some Apache license, uh, the a lot of the core people that worked on Kafka no longer work at LinkedIn, and so they work for a company I think called Confluent. Yep. Um, yep. So we are still an open collaboration. Like that project is out in the open, and we collaborate as if it was like a project like Ember, um, that governance model. We have other libraries that, uh, we have a Rust framework called Restly. Uh, I think people at Coursera also kind of, we do a lot of collaboration with them. Um, but it, it's more on a project to project basis. Sometimes we, we, we open source uh, things because we think that there's gonna be uh, like, so it's, you know, it's solving, uh, can be solving somewhat of a a problem that you will only uh, incur at like a certain scale, and so like the number of users that you you typically get out of uh, those things, I think, isn't as big as something as like a Rust framework or uh, something like Ember or something. I guess a little bit more general purpose. Um, cool. Yeah. No, Kafka is a really interesting example. Yeah. Like that approach of you know putting it out in the world and. Really, I don't know if it was deliberate, but enabling the the folks who did that to go mm -hmm. off and spin up a company around yeah. that, that's uh, incredible, right? It's, yeah. This is this is not something. This is when, like, this is where you see this idea of benevolence and giving back in mm -hmm. tech actually playing out. Yeah. Which a lot of times it's, I mean. I love Google in a lot of ways, but a lot of their don't be evil is pretty much marketing <laughs> at this point. Like some of the stuff they've done out there, I'm a little dubious. Um, this is the, you know, that's the real type of thing. You're giving back to the community and to the industry. Yep. Um, and uh, Confluent is now rapidly growing startup, C yep. stage, I think C, yeah. C round funded, um, several hundred people and getting in all over the place, yep. making the world better yep. across all industries, whereas yep. it could have just died inside of LinkedIn and yeah. then you're, you know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure like 
the w- the way that that whole thing went down was like on like very good terms. Like the peop uh, the fo- the engineering folks at LinkedIn were actually like really excited for, uh, I think his name is Jay Crap. So Jay, and, yeah, uh, and yeah. all of and his team to kind of like go and do this and. Uh, this o- kind of like open source consultancy type of uh, company that provides all these like solutions and everything like that. So I, yeah, I, I'm pretty positive that they left on like good terms. It wasn't like get out of here. Oh, guess what? I'm gonna steal this thing that we open sourced. And it was like yeah, uh, <laughs> something. I mean, that's, bad actor stuff. That's what's made Silicon Valley amazing is the cross pollination yeah. and the fact that people are able to go back and forth and back and forth and. You know, I think it's something that some companies are very supportive of, and mm-hmm. others sort of accept as the cost of doing business in Silicon mm-hmm. Valley. And yeah. it's really neat to see a company doing that. Yeah, um, and yeah. it's neat to see how Microsoft has shifted in that direction. <laughs> right. right. I think right. LinkedIn has been that way for a while, but Microsoft now bears almost no relation to Microsoft of 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the transformation that Satya has done over there has been like pretty incredible like uh or i don't know how many years ago it was but like when they announced that they were actually allow you to like uh run uh, a thin layer of like linux on your like windows machine i was like like hell is frozen over at this point like uh they i think i i just really i think that he is very much on board of having open solutions to a lot of these problems and it kind of shows uh like Quite literally, I think Microsoft might be like the largest organization on GitHub or something. Yeah. Um, so. Well, and yeah. they're open sourcing key stuff. Like, yeah. like, I would never have anticipated that things like C Sharp and all those yeah. things were going to be yeah. put out in the open domain. Yeah. And it's phenomenal, right? It's it's uh, it's an area where we've long had kind of a public goods problem mm-hmm. where everyone is benefiting from open source, but not everyone is giving back. Yeah. And we still have a lot of challenges for how to support folks who are outside of these right. large yeah. corporations in yeah. doing it. But I think uh, you know, having the support and the, the willingness to let folks you know, put this thing out there and then mm-hmm. go out and start a company based on it or interact with the community, not just on their own terms, mm-hmm. but on the community's terms, yeah. um, we need to see more of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I like the approach that LinkedIn has taken with allowing like people to work on like if there's a bug in open source plan feel free to go fix it like uh and use your time to to fix those types of things because we we benefit from them so absolutely awesome uh so your talk is today or tomorrow uh or sorry is, thursday it is thursday thursday cool so good luck yeah thank um, you. i'm looking forward so that's going to be talking about compilers and ember or just compilers uh, talking about the work that we did uh it's doing a little bit of history of compilers and what we've used them for and then kind of talking a little bit more about the glimmer vm and the work that we've done there is kind of like an example of the types of things that we might need to build or would like to build in the future, like type of thing. Nice. So based on our conversation here, I'm sure you're going to rock it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thanks. But best of luck, show skill. Thanks for taking the time to, yeah. to chat with me. This has been fun. Yeah, it's been great. All right. Thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor. Share this show with a friend. We're just going to have a podcast. Go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things right here at ChangeLaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash ChangeLaw. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at ChangeLaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.